This machine is a linear dividing engine and it would have been used in days gone by for creating the scales for scientific instruments and such like. I bought it recently at auction with the idea that I'm going to restore it in an upcoming video and it's got a number of these small components on it, these uh, ratchet wheels and indexing wheels and such like. They're going to need some hand fettling and I've got the idea in my head that I need a tool to make that job easier. So I've decided to make an instrument maker's vise. It effectively acts like a third hand. You can clamp your workpiece in the uh, in the vise drawers here and then very quickly reorient and reposition the workpiece uh, with that clamp screw on the back, which is going to make working on those small components a lot easier. I bought this from Hemingway Kits and as per usual it comes with uh, everything you need to complete the project, including the casting, all the bar stock and a good set of plans. The casting is decent quality, but as with all castings it is going to require some fettling before we uh, get to the machining. We've got the casting upside down in the uh, in the mill vise here, um, so the foot is facing up, which is the part that we need to machine next. Now, um, aligning it to the mill um, at this point is quite tricky because there aren't any reference surfaces to go off. We've just got the rough casting itself, but I'm using the uh, dial test indicator here to average out that surface and get it aligned with the mill axis. The idea of this foot feature is that it allows us to clamp the tool in a bench vise and as such we don't need to be too worried about the, uh, the dimensions here, nothing's critical, we just need to make sure that we clean up the casting and that these surfaces are reasonably square and parallel to each other and then we should be good to go. I love working with cast iron, it's a great material to machine but it is really messy. As you can see uh, here it creates this uh, really fine dust that just gets everywhere and is a nightmare to clean up but I think at the end of the day the results are worth it. Now one thing I do need to do here is to create an undercut. Now the reason that we need this undercut is that this part gets clamped in the uh, in the in the bench vise jaws and we don't want that fillet in the back corner there to interfere with that with that fit. We want to uh, give the jaws the chance to clamp squarely and securely on that central boss there. So just using a 4 mil end mil cutter here and cutting about half a mil deep just to um, just to relieve that 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 fillet in the back corner. Once we've broken those edges, then that's that feature complete. And uh, this is how the part is intended to sit in the vise. And with that undercut in place, it clamps nice and securely. The next thing we need to do is to machine this bore here, which will accommodate the spindle of the clamp assembly, which we'll make later in the video. I've got the part clamped in the side of the vise here in this rather dubious looking setup and uh, I'm just indicating in on those newly machined surfaces to make sure that the um, spindle bore that we're going to machine in a second uh, is as parallel as possible to the base. But before we get to that, we're just going to dust off the top there to make sure we've got a nice clean flat surface to drill into. The next problem I faced was trying to find the centre of this feature here and it's not as easy as it sounds because it is slightly out of round so using a, a centre finding tool like this um, doesn't give you uh, particularly good results. So this only really needs to be cosmetically on the centre to make sure that the knobs look good when they're, when they're lined up. It doesn't have to be perfectly bang on. So what I ended up doing in the end was machining up a round disc with a hole in the middle and kind of feeling with my fingers to when it felt like it was in the middle and then uh, using that um, to make a sharpie mark uh, which I used as my centre point. I'm cutting here dry because cast iron is self lubricating and you don't need to use any additional uh, lubricant with it and uh, I'm working my way through the drill sizes to just under half an inch and then finally finishing off with a half inch reamer to finish that bore and then coming in and chamfering that edge. The final machining operation on this casting is to flip the part round and just to clean up the back of the uh, the face on that bore there so we get a nice mating surface for the, uh, the knob that will go there later on. So that's the machining on the casting complete for now and we need to move on to this clamp ring and clamp spindle assembly and uh, the first thing we're going to tackle is the is the clamp ring and uh, this has a number of interesting features which I'll talk about in due course and it's made from inch and an eighth free machining mild steel and the first job here is to face off the end. 
The dimensions specified on the drawing for the OD of this part is uh, an inch and an eighth, which is right on the uh, nominal size of the bar stock that's provided with the kit. Now, um, I'm not happy with the mill scale finish. I'd like a machined finish. So I'm just cleaning up the OD here with one of these polished carbide inserts that are designed specifically for aluminium and brass. These do work in steel. They don't last very long, but they, they do leave a lovely surface finish. The dimensions for the OD here aren't critical. It's just cosmetics. So this shouldn't cause us a problem. The dimensions that do matter are the internal bores and we need two concentric internal bores here. One of three quarters of an inch that goes all the way through the part and another of seven eighths that goes three quarters of an inch deep. This leaves a lip at the end of the part that will constrain the clamp spindle in use. We do need to be quite close with our tolerances on this part so um, according to the plans we need to be within one thousandth of an inch and uh, checking it with the snap gauges there I'm, uh, I'm within that tolerance so I'm quite pleased with that. Off camera, I went and uh, machined the second bore and you can see the lip down at the uh, the bottom of the uh, recess there. And uh, yeah, checking that dimension, we've also uh, managed to keep it within the tolerance. So that all looks good so far. And now we just need to part that off to the correct length, which in this case is three quarters of an inch. And using a piece of aluminium drinks can to protect the part, I flipped it around in the chuck. I'm gonna face it and chamfer it just to finish that end. And then that's us done with this clamp ring part for the time being. We do still need to cross drill it, but we'll, um, we'll make the clamp spindle first because we need to cross drill both components in the same operation. I need to machine three concentric diameters onto this clamp spindle. There's a seven eighth section with a, a three quarter inch collar that's going to interface with the, uh, the clamp ring. And then the rest of the shaft needs to be half an inch. That shaft's got a thread on the end. And then we need to cross drill it along with the clamp ring, as I said earlier, to accept the vice strut. That's our 7 8 section complete and we've got a nice sliding fit with our clamp ring there with minimal play which is just what we're looking for. And now we need to turn down the 3 quarter inch collar. So again, I'm quite pleased with the fit on this. It's a nice sliding fit, and uh, that means we can get on with turning the rest of the shaft down to half an inch. We now need to cut a thread on the end of the clamp spindle to receive the locking nut that's going to lock the assembly together. Now the plans call for a half inch BSF thread, which is uh, British standard fine. It's quite an old and outdated standard here from the UK. Um, I think the American equivalent would be something like half inch 16 TPI, I think. Um, but I don't have any of the uh, taps or dies for British standard fine. So I'm going to make this a metric uh, equivalent and I've gone for an M12 by one, which is quite a fine thread, but it should do us well in this instance, I think. By the way, if you're interested in this tailstock die holder, I made this in a previous video and I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to check that out. So that's most of the uh, turning done on our clamp spindle. Um, we just need to finish off the end face there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit our, our clamp ring that we made earlier, flip it around in the chuck and then uh, face both parts in the one operation. So 
So that's all the work that we can do on the clamping uh, ring and the clamping spindle for now. Uh, there are a couple more operations we need to perform on these parts, but we can't do those until we've made the clamping nut, which we'll do next. That's going to fit on the uh, threaded portion at the back of the spindle, as you can see here. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to check the fit of the spindle in the casting. And that's a really nice fit. It looks pretty good, I think. So we're on the right track. The next job is to make these two knobs so we can see. We've got the uh, vice knob here and the uh, clamping knob. The vice knob opens and closes the vice jaws via that, um, that screw thread. And the clamping knob locks tight this whole vice strut assembly. And I'm going to start with the vice knob. The kit comes with the uh, the basket that you need to make this. It's inch and three quarter free machining mild steel, and we should be able to get um, both the uh, the clamping knob and the vice knob out of the same piece of stock. Now the instructions call for you to set the uh, stock up on on the mill here with um, with a rotary table and to uh, and to to plunge down with a, an end mill, a three eighths end mill. I'm using ten mil here, um, but I don't have a rotary table, so I'm using the um, bolt circle function on the um, on the DRO on a two inch PCD and uh, just moving to the appropriate locations and plunging down. And the idea with plunging so deep is that we uh, will hopefully be able to get both knobs out of the same piece of stock without having to set it up twice. We have got a few chatter marks in the recesses there, but I'll uh, polish those out later on. And uh, we do have the uh, the mill scales to uh, contend with here. So I'm just gonna do a quick skim pass to clean that up. You can see in the top right of the screen, a cross section of the knob we're making here. And now obviously we've done the OD and the, uh, and the recessed part. We now need to um, machine this kind of tapered section and this final diameter here, uh, as well as through bore it, thread it, and then machine this tapered section on the other side. Now the way I'm going to approach these tapered um, sections on the on the back side here is I'm going to turn the um, OD down to a, a boss that's going to be the major diameter of that um, the top of that tapered section. I'm then going to turn another boss that's going to be the uh, the minor diameter, and then I'll I'll tilt the cross slide round and uh, and cut that taper. The surface finish I'm getting off that carbide insert isn't anything to write home about, so we'll give it a little clean up with the uh, Scotch Bright before moving on. And now to create the through bore to accept the uh, the thread. The plans again call for another BSF thread here, this time a 3 8 um, And once again, I'm going to substitute for a metric fine. This time I'm going for M10 by 1. If you're across the pond, then a 3 8 by 20 should do just fine. So that's one side of the first knob complete now, and we need to part the thing off so we can uh, flip it around in the chuck and machine the other side. Unfortunately, my uh, parting tool wasn't quite long enough, so I'm having to finish the job with a hacksaw. Off camera, I've machined up a screw mandrel with an appropriate thread, M12 by one in this case, so that we can hold our part and machine the other side of it. I've set the cross slide over to 30 degrees again so that we can cut the internal taper to match the uh, external taper on the other side. This is just a cosmetic feature, so if you don't want to do this, you don't have to, but uh, I think it looks nice, so I'm going to do it.
So that's our vice knob complete. I'm quite pleased with it. Uh, it's, a nice, it's a good looking part, I think. Um, still got a few little marks in those recesses that I need to clean up, but uh, overall it's come out quite well. And off camera, I made the clamp knob too. Uh, nothing new to show here. It's exactly the same process, just uh, different dimensions and a different thread. Now we need to go back to our clamp ring and our clamp spindle and drill a crossbore through the, uh, the big end there to accept the vice strut. And in terms of work holding for the machining, what we're going to do is hold them in the casting along with our newly machined clamp knob. I'm using the edge finder here to locate the uh, both sides of the casting so that we can accurately locate our hole on center. I have used a bit of masking tape there to protect the uh, newly machined surface uh, because these edge finders do tend to mark up mild steel if you're not careful and that's a reasonably nice job of uh, protecting our part. My plan of attack here is to mill a small flat on the top of that cylindrical surface so that we've got a nice flat spot for our drill to start on and there's less chance of it wandering off course. And there goes our nice finish. This is a great example of what happens when you get lazy in machining and you don't think things through properly. I already had that 12 millimeter uh, slot drill, the two flute end mill in the uh, chuck there. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna dust off a little bit of material here. I'm not, I'm not gonna need to change that, it should be fine. But of course it wasn't. The tool pressure was too much for that um, part, which was only clamped by the, uh, the force of the knob there. And I should have swapped it out for a four flute um, end mill with a smaller diameter. But anyway, we should be able to hide most of that with the, uh, the hole that we're gonna put through the uh, part in a moment. And uh, the rest of it, I'll clean up later on. So I don't think it's gonna be too much of a problem. So that's our clamp ring and our clamp spindle drilled and reamed to half an inch. Now, I think I've got rid of most of that damage. There is still a little bit around the uh, around the edges, as you can see there, along with a uh, sharp burr. So we're just gonna go over to the lathe now and give that a skim cut just to clean that up. And that seems to have done the trick, although that edge is still very sharp, so I'm gonna clean that up with a fine ruby stone. And just doing a quick test fit there with the half inch silver steel that we're gonna use for the vice strut. And uh, I've got a nice sliding fit, which is great. But what we actually need to do is to get those parts to clamp onto that vice strut, which of course at the moment they're not gonna do because they were machined in the same operation. What we actually need to do is to create a little bit of lateral movement between the two parts by removing some material from these two back faces and therefore creating a little bit of space on that clamp spindle so that it can move within the clamp ring, therefore creating the clamping force. We don't need a lot of space, the plans uh, say about five thousandths of an inch. That's a bit more than five thou, but uh, I think that's going to work just fine. Whilst I'm at it, I'm going to machine the uh, vice strut. Now this is made of uh, half inch silver steel or drill rod and uh, it's a really simple part to make. It's faced on both ends and then we put a small taper on one end and a thread on the other. The thread is 3 8 BSF, but again I'm going to swap this out for an M10 by one millimeter. I'm going to move on now to the vice block and it's this component here you can see in the diagram. It's two and a quarter inches long by three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. It's made of free machine mild steel and the bar stock that you get with it is at nominal size. I don't like the mill scale finish so I've given it a skim cut across all four sides and I'm uh, bringing the part to length now. The first operation we need to perform on this part is to drill and tap a hole to accept the uh, thread that we made earlier on the vice strut. I'm gonna make mine M10 by one, which is what I used on the vice strut, but again, you can use 3 8 BSF or 3 8 by 20.
I flip the part around in the vise and I'm just locating the edges there so that I can use the DRO to position some holes. We need to drill and counterbore two M4 holes to hold on the vise jaw that's going to sit on the opposite side of this part. We then flip the part over in the vise so that we can mill away a recess to accommodate that vise jaw. And now for a 3 8 through hole to accept the vise guide bar. That guide bar is made out of 3 8 precision ground uh, drill rod and it's, uh, it's a good fit so I'm pleased with that. We also need another hole for the uh, guide screw that's going to actuate the jaws of the vise and uh, this is a, a 3 8 BSF thread as specified in the plans but again I'm swapping it out for a metric uh, M10 by 1. So that's our vice block complete. We'll screw in the vice strut here and then we can check where we are with the build up to this point. And things are coming together nicely. That clamping action is really secure. It's really easy to tighten and uh, very easy to, to loosen and reposition, which is great. Just what we're looking for. Next up, I'm going to make the vice jaw that clamps onto the vice block that we've just finished. It's an inch and a half long by three quarters of an inch wide by a quarter of an inch deep. Once again, we're making it from free machining mild steel. I've skimmed all the faces and now I'm putting in two holes, two M4 threaded holes, so that we can bolt the uh, vice jaw to the vice block that we made uh, just a moment ago. We need to do a little bit of layout now for a couple more features. Uh, one is a chamfered edge on the part. Um, so I'm just going to bolt the part to the vice block that we've made already and scribe a line where we want the chamfer to come to. Then flipping the part over, I've scribed some lines for some V grooves that we need to machine to the face of the jaw so that we can hold round parts. To machine the chamfer, it's a simpler question of uh, holding it in a V block at 45 degrees and machining up to the line. Now to get these grooves in the right place, we could use some trigonometry, but I'm not, not going to do that. I'm just going to simply touch off the uh, the cutter on the, on the scribe line there. Um, and then I'm going to move the cutter down by half a millimetre and across by half a millimetre, which should give us the, uh, the, the correct size grooves in the right location. So with the grooves cut, that's our part complete, and this is it bolted in place. Only a couple more components to go now, but this next one is a critical one. This is the vice screw. We have this long thread here um, that screws into the main body of the vice, and a short thread there for the vice knob, and also a central boss to actuate the uh, moving jaw. So we're going to blow up our component here and mark it out for that central boss, as well as the two threads. Now we need to reduce the diameter of the uh, shaft here to the major diameter of the thread and that's um, 3 8 BSF as per the plans but um, again I'm going to substitute this for an M10 by 1. Thank you. 
And we're doing the same on the other side of the boss for the uh, thread for the knob. And I'm using a left hand turning tool here so that we can turn right up to that boss. Then I'm going to single point the uh, threads on both sides of the boss. Part it off. And that's our finished part. The final component we're going to make is the moving jaw. And it's crucial that we get these two holes exactly half an inch apart. This, these accommodate the vice screw and the guide bar. And if we don't get them exactly uh, half an inch apart to match the uh, vice body that we've already made, then the vice is going to bind up in operation. I'm using a countersink here to create the uh, recess that we need to accommodate the boss on the vice screw that we made earlier. This is conveniently for me exactly the right diameter, but you could also use a boring head for this or failing that, put it in the four jaw chuck in the lathe. The rest of the features on this movable vice jaw are purely cosmetic and we're going to start off with the chamfer on the back of the vice jaw. I'm going to create the shoulders of the vice jaw now and I'm going to do that by milling away the sides in a moment. But what I want to do is to have a nice smooth fillet in the corners. So we're going to put some uh, six millimeter holes in and then we can mill up to those holes. I've added some layout lines and flipped the part around in the vise and now it's just a question of uh, milling away that excess material. I flipped the part around, repeated the process on the other side and deburred it and that's our finished vise jaw. And that's all the machining done. So we're on to finishing now and the first job is to paint the casting. I'm no expert when it comes to painting and finishing so if anyone's got any uh, help and advice it would be very much appreciated. But I'll talk you through what I did anyway and, uh, and show you some of the things that didn't go quite so well. My initial thinking was that I would spray the casting with some filling primer and then rub it back, exposing the, uh, the high points and hopefully filling some of the low points with the idea that I would give it then another coat and uh, rinse and repeat. Now some of, the, um, some of the low points as you can see here were a bit too uh, deep to be filled. So I used a bit of this filler putty to uh, fill in those low spots. And once that was all cured, I rubbed it all down again. Now in hindsight, I should have spent a bit more time fettling the casting, I think, and I probably should have done some of this filling before I even started with the, uh, with the painting. But once it was re-sprayed with primer, it started looking a lot better. And yeah, I, I repeated this process another couple of times before I uh, moved on to the top coat. I did attempt to film the painting process, but um, I was getting a lot of overspray and uh, it was putting the camera equipment at risk, so I gave that up as a bad job. Whilst I used a rattle cam for the primer layer, I did do the top coat with this airbrush. And I even used uh, some of these uh, Jonesy uh, stencils that I made with a vinyl cutter on a previous project to put a small logo on the top of the workpiece. And this is what it turned out like. Now, whilst it looks semi-decent from halfway across the room, I think there are a number of, uh, number of defects in the paint job. Uh, there's some finger marks on the side there that you can see where I picked it up too quickly after, the, uh, after spraying it. And there's a number of defects on the top uh, where I actually dropped it because I'm an absolute cretin. I just finished applying the second coat of lacquer and it was looking absolutely mint. I was so pleased with it. I thought, um, I just, I just put one more coat of lacquer on it and it's going to look even better. And of course, as I was doing that, I knocked it off the table, it hit the floor and uh, yeah, that was that. Because the uh, the top coat was still wet, it took uh, all the paint off right down to the primer in these areas here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've tried to rub it back and re, re lacquer it, but the more you do, the worse it looks. And I've actually worn through the paint into the primer on some of those edges uh, and so on. So I'm just going to leave it as it as it is. I mean, you know, it'll be an interesting story, won't it? 
So that's the manufacture of our parts complete and the, uh, the body of the tool painted. Now I'm a fan of the finish on these bare metal parts, but given the uh, color scheme that I've chosen on the body, I think they're actually gonna look better chemically blued. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I've cleaned the parts with acetone and then you just drop them into the chemical blue solution and wait for them to oxidize. It takes about three minutes normally. Let me take the parts out of the solution and dab them dry with a paper towel before applying a coat of oil. This oil soaks into the surface and helps protect it. Then we set the parts aside for an hour or two for the oxide to harden and uh, we wipe off the excess oil. And that's all the parts complete, so on to final assembly. And that is our instrument maker's vice complete. Um, I'm quite pleased with the way it's come out. I like the finish on the uh, black oxide parts. I think that suits the color screen, scheme nicely. And general fit and finish, I think it passes the fleeting glance at six paces test, so I'm happy enough with that. But um, the really important question is, how does it function? And the answer to that is much better than I expected, actually. Um, that locking action is really quick and really secure. Uh, I think that's down to the fine threads that we've uh, used. But um, yeah, really pleased with that. It's just so quick and easy to uh, change the position. And the, uh, the range of position is also really, really good. When you're working on a small part like this, for instance, it's really simple and really quick to just reposition the vise to get it to the exact angle that you need. Whilst I was at it, I thought I might as well make myself a box to keep it in. And I've included this little barcode thing here, which links to this video uh, as a little Easter egg to anyone that might find this tool in the future long after I'm gone. So in conclusion, I'm really pleased with this little vise. I think it's going to be really useful around the shop for small parts. And uh, I'm, I'm really pleased I made it. It was a fun project. And if you're interested in making one, I'll leave a link in the description to where you can buy it. As always, guys, thanks ever so much for watching. It's really appreciated. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more, then uh, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon. That means you get notified when the, uh, when the next video comes out. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, then you can do so at Patreon. Links in the description. Or please do check out my website and shop at jonesymakes.com.